Hey up everybody and welcome back. Right, well obviously you know what the project's going to be. So before we get stuck into we're talking about the planning for that, uh, big piece of news is we are over 4,000 subscribers. 4,030 something and uh, still getting them coming in regularly. So again, thanks all to all of you for that. Uh, it's greatly appreciated. Which is a phrase I've noticed I keep using a lot. But anyway, it is. So today, uh, and this week, what we're gonna do is we're gonna look in detail at all the bits we're gonna use. Because I've already had uh, one thing which I'll show you. Funnily enough, with forks again. It's like th threads. Forks seem to be the bane of my life. Anyway, we're gonna go through all of the items we've decided to use and start doing some measurements, seeing what will fit, what won't fit, see if we've got any, do any modifications. Um, I had a nice long email with some photographs of his bike from, you've guessed it, I can't remember, sorry about that. But he actually used to race in armor, which is, let me think, the American Historic Racing Motorcycle Association. I used to ride their trials, well, one of their trials, because they're nearly all over on the West Coast. But they actually have a class for XS650. So he sent me some pictures of his um, of the bike he used to ride and some various bits and pieces of information. So thank you very much for that. It's a nice bike. So there is a precedent for this, which actually I thought there was, and that was one of the reasons why I chose it. But anyway, let me not waffle on. Uh, what we're gonna do is I'm gonna show you some pictures and put a little uh, commentary on them to explain the thinking behind this and also if any of you have been to my website www.britanniamotorcycles.com you'll have seen in the gallery that I built a Yamaha 650 engined XT500 and as you'll see in a couple of the photographs the XT500 frame was basically a dead knockoff of the B50 not only in the design, but very much in the dimensions. So that's why I was pretty certain that this engine will fit, which as you'll see when I show you some measurements, it is going to do. So, all right, here we go with sort of preliminary pictures and ideas. Now here's the bike that got me thinking about the present project. A Rickman Triumph Matisse, a uh, really cobby looking machine. See how neatly the twin engine fits in? Although we won't have all the bodywork, that's sort of the thing we're aiming for, something really purposeful and not enormously tall. Now, here's another one. This one's a Cheney. Uh, and again, same thing. No spare space, just everything made to look very, very workable. It's something else. Uh, possibly it might even look more like this than the, the Rickman. Then we come to one bike that I actually built. This one has the XS650 engine in an XT500 frame. 650 forks and wheels, makes it a lot uh, nicer. It's smaller, it's lighter and uh, really worked out well. Here you can see what I had to do to the frame. Uh, you can see it's very like the B50 and at the bottom I cut the tubes out and then put new ones in so the engine actually sits lower in the frame. You can see where I went mad with the exhaust to get the Ducati look for them. And here's where I had to uh, do something with the carbs because the twin carbs fouled the frame tubes and the exhausts. So what I did was I made a two into one manifold and just mounted one of the carbs. It was it was nice and cheap and easy to do. And we may do that with this bike. Right, let's start with the central item, the frame. Now, you may notice there's no bits on this one. I've swapped it over. The other B50 frame, which as I said was an MX frame, when I checked my little list I found that I did have a title for it, so I don't want to use that. But when I looked in, the one you may remember was at the back of the wall, is also an MX, and it's one of the MXs they sold definitely for motocross because, I don't know if you can see, you won't be able to read it because it's too far away, but there is a sticker on from the BSA factory and that sticker says whoop, 
Where are we? Manufactured by BSA Engineering Limited for competition and off-road use only, not subject to federal road vehicle safety standards, not equipped or appro approved for use on public streets, roads or highways. And that strikes me as odd because I honestly can't find a single difference between this and the other frames. The ones for like the B50T, which was a trails bike, and the B50SS, which was the road bike. Anyway, this is the frame we're going to use. So what we're going to do is we're going to start looking at the, uh, the headstock and see what we're going to do with the forks. Now then, the uh, B25s, B50s, what have you, the oil in frame frame, Ford bearings here, unlike say the Enfield, doesn't have the good old British, well, and Japanese, but the old way of having races with loose balls in them. They went to a tapered roller bearing. And that's not the right one. I don't want to have one. Anyway, the thing is they fit in there thus. There's actually no outer race in these, like that. Now, this yoke also, as you'll see, has a taper roller bearing, which is like that, inner and outer race. Now, of course, it turns out that this outer race is too big to fit in there. This ID is 45 millimeters, this is 47 millimeters, and there isn't enough metal to bore this out. Now what I could do of course, that is if I can set it up in the mill, first this way up and then turn the frame over and you know there's so much frame sticking out the back end, it would be really difficult to hold to bore, is I could bore it out and even though it would make the wall very thin here, I could then put a collar, sweat a collar onto that and even weld it up. Well that seems a lot of work. So what I'm going to do instead is we're going to make a new stem for this. This stem is one inch, 25 millimeters. It's a 25 inner uh, bearing uh, with a 47, as I say, outer diameter. Whereas the BSA one is only three quarters inner and an inch and three quarters, which is the 45 millimeter outer. So by doing that, changing the stem, I can just get a new pair of bearings and they'll fit straight in. And because this is an alloy yoke, unlike we've been seeing before, uh, where the, the stem is welded in because it's cast steel, this one might be screwed in, although I doubt it, but it's probably just a press fit. But I will find out, I'm gonna remove this stem and just turn up a new stem. So unfortunate because actually, it's about the right length, look. There's the thread, so once the bearing's in, that big nut would have screwed on there nicely. So we know we're in the right ballpark. What I'll do is I'll make a stem. And you may remember we did this for the Norton forks. And instead of having an outside thread on here and an inside thread, we're just going to have the inside thread. Because the Japanese ones tend to put that in. And then, as I say, you put the top bearing in and then you screw a piece on. And that holds that in like that. Then you can put the top yoke on and just put this in a bolt to hold the top yoke on and a clamp. Whereas you may remember with the British bikes, one of the awkward things of putting the forks in with the loose balls was there was no clamping nut, it was just the top yoke. So you'd have to hold that in, get the bearing in, get the top yoke on, and then tighten up the clamp bolt so it didn't fall out and have all the little ball bearings fall out. So that's the first job on this is to get this made so that it'll fit the bearings. So let's have a look at the forks. All right, forks. Giving these a bit of a clean up and taking the torn gators off. This is the KDX fork, which uh, as you can see is a leading uh, axle, spindle, and is incredibly long. The 36 inches, whereas like the BSA ones or the Yam 651s are only 31. So that's the only thing that I'm wondering about now. They work nicely, they have perfect chrome, which I say they had gators on and that's always a good thing. I like gators. 
So what could we do if we didn't use these? The beauty cost of using these is that I use these, I use the KDX yokes, then the KDX wheel will fit straight in. You know, the wheel spindle will be the right size. There'll be no need to have spaces or make a torque arm up or anything. So that would be good. And of course, they are made for off-road work. But I do have, you may remember these from the Norton Yamaha project. These are Kawasaki as well. I mean, they're made for a disc brake, but that's incidental. These are about three inches shorter. But the other thing about them is they are a smaller diameter stanchion, fork tube. So I don't know. The other thing about these is they're air assist, the same as the uh, KDX ones are, but instead of having a valve on each fork leg, they only have one valve. It's on one fork and then here you'll see there's a hole, there's this collar that goes around there and around the other fork with a piece of tube that joins the two together. And when you pump the one up, the air goes into the other one. So that's all adding complications to it. So I'm really hoping we can use the KDX ones because that will be much better. That way all we have to do is make up that stem for here and then the front end just goes together and we can forget it. So that's the front end. Let's go around and look at the back end. Here's the B50 swinging arm. Natty colour, eh? I think we should paint the bike in that. Yellow and... Whoa, I don't know. Anyway, this is the correct wheel spindle for it. And of course it is a fraction. Fraction longer than that. It's also a smaller diameter. If this had been the right length, I could have just uh, reamed these out because it's not much different. Hang on. Alright, let's actually make some measurements. So the BSA one is 620, so basically 5 eighths. And this one is 663, so it's only 40 thou. But won't go all the way through. I can't even slim this down, I think. Uh, we'll see. So, let's have a look. Here's our back wheel. As I say, I found the brake plate. Because unfortunately now the brake is on the... Oh! Oh, oh, oh! Japanese engine. So that's fine. The gear change is going to be on the left, isn't it? So we're alright, we can put the brake pedal on the right. So I'll use this piece of spindle, even though it's a bit thin. Uh, okay, there's a space piece that goes on. There it is. Can you see that? Space and piece goes on that side. So let's see, does that fit in there? Yes, it does. That's going to go through there. Let's have a look. That will go against that side, which I think it should do. Chain, the sprocket is clear in the... Uh, it's clear in this side. So we've got some space here, so we'd have to put a, well that should be on the other side, we'd we'll have to put a spacer in there, no we won't, why have I put that up there? See you're all watching and you don't tell me any of this. Why didn't you say, Michael, that goes in there like that. Now will that go on? Now we just 
we have to take a little bit off that spacer. But we do have a spacer, so I can face that off a little bit. So we know that will go in. So let's make some measurements about chain line. So here we have another Yamaha 650 engine that's still complete. So you can see we've got the sprocket on. Now this mounting is more or less in fact it is it's in the center of the engine so what we're going to do is we're going to as always we're trying to find ourselves some data points so the easiest one on this is going to be the center so from the outside of the sprocket this is difficult not getting in front of you the outside of the sprocket to what we'll class as the center line is going to be three and where are we? Seven sixteenths. One, two, three. Three and seven sixteenths. Now here's a B50 MX engine. Now uh, here, the centre of the engine isn't the centre of the frame. I think remember somebody mentioned it when we were measuring the end field because fortunately there the split line was on the centre of the, the frame. So what we're going to do is we're going to measure from the outside of the sprocket to here. And the reason we're going to measure to here is because that goes on to a fixed mounting on the frame. So we can work backwards. So we'll know how far the sprocket is from there we can transfer that to the frame and then we can go from there to the center line of the engine and then we're center line to sprocket the same as we are on the XS 650 engine. So, this one's going to be a little more difficult. It might be easy to do it that way because that's a more rigid, yeah. that is, lose my head again, one and seven eighths. One and seven eighths. Let's go right that down before I forget. Get in there. Okay. Stay. Right now. The white mark is the center of the frame. Here's the engine mounting that we measured to. Now the engine plates go on the inside of this. So between that casting that we measured and here is an eighth of an inch. Okay, so now. Well. Now I'm gonna start thinking. So we know from the edge of the casting to the outside of the sprocket it was one and seven eighths. Right? So from the edge of the sprocket to there is going to be one and seven eighths less the eighth of the plate. So that's one and three quarters. So the outside of the sprocket to here is going to be one and three quarters plus, I'm going to take my glasses off, one and a half. One and a half or one and three quarters is three and a quarter. Where am I? Where am I? Not the pen. It's three and a quarter. Three and a quarter. Okay, now then this is a B50 hub, it's actually the one out of that other frame because you can see where I had to saw through the wheel spindle to get the wheel out. Now on the B50 there aren't any spaces, the swinging arm goes right up against the base, the brake plate. There's a tiny little indentation here which is, God. I don't know, I'll measure it because we're going to have to measure across there. So what we're going to do is we're going to measure from there because that will be up against the swinging arm to the outside edge of the sprocket. You'll see where all this is going in a minute. 
So let's put that across there. And measure this. Actually, let me measure it around this way because that's a... Oh! I just backed into the lathe. So that is going to go... And that is... 11 sixteenths. All right. Now, just to be exact, forty eight thou. That's just over a 30, it's like 3 sixty-fourths, but we'll make a note of it. 48, let me check it round the other side. We'll say 50 thou. Right. Now then, I hope you can follow this, because to be quite honest, I had to think about it a bit before I fully understood what I was doing. All right, so what did we measure? On the 650, we measured from the center line of the engine, where we want it to be in the frame, to the outside of the sprocket, and it came to 3 and 7 sixteenths. But that's a 530 sprocket, whereas the one we're going to have on the rear wheel is going to be a 520. So there's an eighth of an inch difference in thickness. Now, because we measured to the outside of the sprocket, if that had been a 520 sprocket, instead of being 3 7 sixteenths, it would have been three and five sixteenths, okay? Now on the BSA, we measured from the engine mounting to the outside of the sprocket. It was one and seven eighths. Then the engine mounting on the frame has an eighth inch plate that goes in it. So from the casting to the outside of the sprocket would have been one and seven eighths, less than eighth. So it's one and three quarters. Then from that point to the center of the frame was at one and a half inches, so we're at three and a quarters. So center line of the yam to the outside of the sprocket, three and five sixteenths. Center line on the B50 to the outside of the sprocket, three and a quarter. So the sprocket is a sixteenth of an inch to the outside. Okay. Then we measured on the hub. And as I said, where the hub is, it goes right up against, if you imagine that's the hub, then the swinging arm is like that. It's right up against it. So we have a point on the swinging arm to measure that's equal to where the hub is. So we measured from this place on the hub, which was the brake plate, out to the sprocket. So we know the distance from there to the sprocket, and it was 11 sixteenths. But we were measuring on a little bump, you remember, which was roughly a sixteenth of an inch. So it's actually 5 eighths. So if we go back to the bike now, from this point on the swinging arm to the outside of the sprocket on the wheel should be 5 eighths. So let's go and have a look. Now the wheel's in, and it's pushed as far over as it'll go to the other side. And I can tell you now, that isn't five eighths. So this ruler is, it's a sixteenth of an inch thick. So we're gonna put that across there. Actually that's pretty dirty. that across there like that and this is five six seven no well no, that's a quarter inch five almost six plus another sixteenth so it's seven sixteenths and we want it to be five eighths 
so that's three sixteenths so the sprocket needs to go in three sixteenths now we have a huge hub that is bolted to here I can put the hub in the lathe and turn it down face it off I should say so that I can move the sprocket over I'm not worried about that but come and look at this as you can see the wheel isn't in the center so what we're gonna to have to do to fit this wheel into this sprocket it's not a big problem we're gonna thin down the hub a little to move our so our sprocket is in line so if you can imagine if we didn't have the rim on the hub will be in and the sprocket will be in line and then what we'll have to do is when we relace the wheel we're going to relace the hub over a little bit I don't know it's what it's uh, seven eighths that side it's a fair bit mine it's seven eighths one side one and seven eighths the other side so that's an inch difference so I'm gonna to have to move it over a half inch which isn't gonna to be too bad because it's a big broad hub we're not gonna sort of have it out of balance or anything so that's what we'll do so that's the back end we know the chain lines not going to be that difficult to do and we know the engine is going to be centered in the frame pretty nicely so let's look at what we're going to do to the frame now then this as you know is the frame that I use for the trials bikes as I say the dimensions are the same it's identical frame for the 250 you know it's the 500 by these strengthening plates now this works well as a scrambler so I actually don't want to change the dimensions or any of the steering geometry at all we're gonna have longer forks we're probably gonna have longer suspension the rear but we're gonna try and match them up so things like the fork angle and everything and the wheelbase stay very similar if the wheelbase is slightly longer to be honest, I would say for a motocrosser, for a scrambler, particularly for a scrambler, it's not going to be that much of a problem because there aren't any really tight turns and it will make the bike more stable. In fact, with trials bikes, if you look at them now, although they have um, the sort of 52 inch wheelbase, you notice that the swinging arm is long. They're trying to make them more stable and be able to sort of twist them a little bit. So anyway, so what do we want to do? Well, I still, want to get rid of this heavy chunk here we don't need it because we, it's a wet sump engine so we don't need an oil tank we don't need that and there's a lot more metal in there than if I do this 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 and this back loop in nice um, chrome moly tubing so what we're going to do is we're going to put it in the jig for the trials frame because that what that does is it holds everything where it should be because it's going to mount on the three engine mounts we'll then cut this out here that's the first piece we'll cut out and if you remember when this is cut out here I put a little cross piece in and then we're going to go from there to there and we'll put some new bracing in this will brace the whole of this and at the moment because there's nothing sort of excessively heavy there that won't do anything then we're going to cut this out to there go from there to there now I could do all this in one I suppose but it's going to be easier like this so then we have the whole frame again back to being stiff from suspension to suspension to swing an arm mount then we'll just make up a new lighter loop to go in the back of there Right, it could even be a bolt up one but the thing is this is going to be where it is now this is going to be where it is at the same angle that's going to be in the same place everything will be fine so once we've got it all sort of rebuilt rigidly then we'll bring the engine to it because as you saw at the beginning with the photographs of the XT500 we're gonna to have to drop the engine down a little bit so these are gonna to have to come out it's gonna be a front engine mounting here we're going to use this to take the mounting at the top of the Yamaha 650 and if we've got that in 
and that in then we can redo the bottom rails with the engine in situ and we can do the bottom mounting everything will be nice and easy so that's for the frame put it in the jig take the front part off remake it take the back part off remake it then we'll fit the engine then we'll do the but well we'll cut the bottom out put the engine in and do the bottom again uh, and then we'll put our forks in this that and the other and we don't have a battery to put on we don't have an oil tank to put on so we'll make a nice air box for the engine so let's go now and have a little look at the engine because there's not much we're going to do to that right what are we going to do with the engine not a lot there's that top engine mounting that will go in the top engine mounting of the frame there's a single mounting underneath at the front which we're going to plate we're going to make engine plates for that and as you can see there's one there and there's one there right so what we're going to do is we're going to mount first of all there and there that'll hold it then we'll make this mount then we're going to do our tubes underneath the bottom to pick up this mount now the starter motor goes on here it actually fits in it goes in there and drives there now I'm going to do the same as I did on the other one I'm going to do away with the starter motor I mean it's supposed to be a scrambler it wouldn't have a starter motor starter motors are heavy so we're going to save a lot of weight and it's right under there on the bottom so we're going to do away with that the other thing we're going to do is because as I say this frame is basically identical to the XT the tubes are going to come down the frame tubes are going to come down and foul having two carbs now there's two possibilities here we'll see we'll make this final decision when we get the engine in the normal carbs on this engine are CV type they're a diaphragm carb so on the top I haven't got one to hand they have a big square diaphragm whereas your carb is normally narrow you know a slim body they're a much chunkier carb and they have this big square thing on the top and having those two it was actually just the diaphragms that fouled on the frame so I made a manifold up and put one carb on I did that because it was cheap I made the manifold up I used one of the Yamaha's twin carbs and the bike ran beautifully but what we could do I'm pretty sure is put a pair of ordinary Makunis or the OKO flat slides because there's such a thinner body at this point that I don't think they'll fr foul the frame tubes we will look we'll see how flush I'm feeling and decide on the carburetors at the last so there we go that's the plan for the bike now I've been thinking just in the last couple of minutes while I was watching that last piece of video to make sure uh, everything looked all right I've had to, well a couple of things I thought of one is we'll also as I say have to build an air box for these either single carb or the twin carbs the other thing we, of course we'll have to do is exhaust pipes now you saw on the Rickman they sort of came down the cylinder and ran like that and you saw that I went absolutely mad as I mentioned on the XT because I wanted to have them at the back here like a Ducati so they came out and they looped in there and oh, they were a nightmare we're not going to do that but we are going to have high level pipes and I'm half thinking no I don't think it'll work I was half thinking of bringing them round here and making sort of the box of the silencer in here we might be able to do it depends on where the carbs are might get too much heat so we don't know but they'll be high, obviously they'll be high level pipes I also had a thought when I built the Triumph engine into one of these frames uh, you'll have seen it in the opening credits because of the exhaust I actually had to swan neck the frame to get inside the exhaust but I didn't put any bottom tubes what I did was I used quarter inch plate which is really strong fastened to the front fastened to the back 
and then bolted onto that was a bottom mounting. Now this one, it's, it's I mean look at these. When we get to look at the engine, I'm just hoping that that will drop in there. We might even just be able to make up some plates exactly the same as the VSA is and catch both rear engine mountings. We'll, um, the reason we're going to uh, do this first is because we've got a center line, right? If we can get that rear engine mounting in there, put a couple of spaces in, we'll have the engine exactly where we want it. Then we can, we'll have already drilled, cut this off. Same as with the Triumph, we'll have drilled through there, two places, sleeved it, because you don't want to just put a bolt through and clamp up, or the tube. The tube will compress a little bit and your bolt will come loose. You've got to have sleeves through so you're bolting tight. We can make up an engine plate to go at the front engine mounting. If we've got that bolted in there, we've got that bolted in there, and we've got it bolted in here. Chunk, 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 chunk. You see the triangulation going through the mass of the bottom of the engine? That is going to be really strong. I don't think we need the bottom tubes. We'll do exactly the same. We'll have a plate, and on the plate will be a couple of ears sticking up that a bolt will go through that final bottom engine mounting so that not only will it be rigid, but it'll stop any chance of it shaking. And I seem to remember that the XS has quite a hefty head uh, steady as well. It'll be really... If we've got these three points and a nice big head steady, God, that, we won't need anything under there. So we'll just put a nice quarter inch thick bash plate. So what do you think, people? Uh, I've even had an idea for the colours, but I'm not letting on about that. Uh, so that's it for it for this week. There's the plan. Uh, the sort of order we'll do it in is the frame, as I mentioned engine in front forks and everything as I say are going to be so easy because it's all going to be KDX just pop that in the wheel be in the wheel be lined up on the center line everything will be perfect there bit of machining to do at the back end so the major work really is going to be the frame and probably the exhausts now the exhaust will be different because just before we go I'll show you something right as the horrible Harleys left, I had a little bit of money. And I thought to myself, what would I buy if I didn't actually have to take the money out of my pocket, but I had like found money? So I thought, a mandrel pipe bender. Now everybody I watch uh, who fabricates using tubing, you know, like roll cages and stuff, because I watch all sorts of things, as long as it's good workmanship, it fascinates me. They all use this JD squared one. Uh, so I thought I'd get one of these. This itself isn't that expensive. It's only, well, I'll say it isn't expensive. It was 300 and something dollars. But you have to have the dies. And the dies are a couple of hundred dollars each. And you need a different die for each diameter of tube. And different dies for the size of the bend. So I got this one. Ordered some dies. I've mounted it to the welding table. Because this sort of ratcheting system that they have. So you move it round and move it round by little increments. means you don't have to put a lot of pressure in. Uh, so I ordered half inch, three quarter inch, one inch and one and a half inch tube diameter dies. Um, and I slipped up already. The half inch ones I was thinking about, like on the end field, the, the real loops for the, for the mud guard. And I wanted them to be about four and a half inch diameter bend. So I ordered a four and a half inch one. And then when it came, I looked at it and I thought, that's big. And it struck me, they're measured in radius, bend radius, not bend diameter. So a four and a half inch bend radius is nine inches from one side of the bend to the other. So I have to send it back. And they weigh a ton, so it's gonna cost me a fortune in shipping. All right, so there it is. Uh, this should be interesting because, you know, it's, it's like bending sheet metal. You don't just bend it, you've got to take into account the size of the tool and all sorts of stuff. So probably when we start off, we're going to have to have, to have a big lump sticking out the end and then cut lots off. But there you go. Christmas present for me. So, I'll have to order some tube and get playing with this. 
we know what we've got to do on the project so until next time when we get started on the frame go off and enjoy yourselves hey up well just when you were off to have a cup of tea there uh, here I am again I was just doing the video and it suddenly struck me that of all the stuff I showed you I hadn't mentioned actually fitting the engine in the frame so I donned my best quality USAF Parker courtesy of my daughter and uh, came down through the snow to show you this so let me move the camera and rather than just show you the measurements I'll give you a view of what the engine will look like when it goes in the frame right rather than just compare uh, measurements as I did when the engine and the frame were up on the shelf I thought I'd stand it there like that and put you at an angle so you could see sort of your level with it the engine and the space in the frame so as you can see it all fits in nicely we've got uh, space at the back there front engine mounting more or less lines up with this so when this piece is gone we'll be fine uh, we probably just cut these out and leave the entire tube there might have to shorten it a bit but anyway there's going to be a triangular engine plate so the tube the frame tube will be drilled there and there probably triangular plate made so that it mounts to this front engine mounting then the rear engine mountings this top one which is I don't know four inches wide at the back it's only two inches wide and it comes it comes through actually about here so as you see look there's there's where the engine mounting is there and there is this one so it's almost exactly in line with it so what I'm going to be able to do which is always really nice is put this engine in right on that that's the first mounting it can sort of go on that and we can because we've got all our measurements we can put a couple of spaces in and we can bolt the engine in back there and it'll be exactly right for the chain now unfortunately this bottom one is the distance between those two is about half an inch more than the distance between those but what I might be able to do is just cut through them and literally turn that round a bit weld them back up and then they'll go straight on otherwise I'll make something up at the bottom and we'll do it with a plate I don't know we'll think about that but we can do that we can do the front and that'll be great now I've lifted the frame up because the bottom of the engine is going to go down in there I'm not sure whether it'll actually fit now or whether as I had to do the XT500 I cut this bit out mount the engine and then make new ones lower down to hit that bottom engine mounted which is about here okay would be nice if it lined up with that but I doubt that very much anyway so you can see there's plenty of space there now as to the head the space there as it is but don't forget this will be coming out certainly that piece is coming out and this is I don't know two and something inches we're going to be one nice one and a half inch chrome molly tube there all braced up at the front so there's going to be lots of space in the top we don't want to raise it up too much we want our weight nice and low down now I mentioned the head steady now unlike most engines let that lorry go past the head steady on this doesn't just have a couple of plates that bolt onto the sort of studs that go through the cylinder and through the head it actually cast in there are two enormous bosses huge rib through the middle here you see it more when we when we sort of look at the engine but this is a very substantial mounting so with that mounted to the top tube and these two even just those two this is going to be hugely rigid so by the time we got the back one in this one is almost completely superfluous so we'll have to see what's what so as you can see the engine fits in nicely now then, I had one other thought as well and that is that I was thinking trials bike so I was thinking of the footrest being here but they're not are they they're going to be down here they actually come off this cross tube there's a slot in it to position them so they come up they come up here so we don't know what we're going to do with that might be that when I cut this out it'll drop in and leave that there that would be nice because then we can just slightly modify the BSA B50 ones but if not we might use something like the XS650 method which had a lug on the frame there and another lug down here and then a big cast piece that had a through bolt and a through bolt 
and then continued down here and had the foot rests on it. So we could always make a mount in there and have them extended out. So that's that. So don't worry if you're sitting there at home thinking, oh, he's done all that measuring and when he does the frame, the engine won't go in. It will. So that really is the end of the video. You can go off and have your cup of tea. I'm going back up to the house. So you uh, go off and enjoy yourselves for sure this time.